Uh, let's go ahead and um, start. I'm going to talk a little bit about our artist. So Lisa Kernichfield uh, was born and raised in Little Rock, um, and she uh, interesting cultural mix of Chinese family living um, in the American South. Um, she works mainly with uh, female subjects and about, uh, uh, you know, specifically how uh, they're catered to the male gaze. Uh, she did win the Delta exhibition a couple years back in 2018, and that's where I first learned about her. And I was like, ah, we got to get that artist here. So here she is, um, big dreams coming reality. So, um, uh, Lisa, why don't you go ahead and start us off with uh, uh, what you got, talk a little bit about uh, your artwork and have some visual aids. Sure. Yeah, thank you for having me and thanks for coming. Um, I'm in my studio right now and so you can see some finished pieces behind me uh, in La Rock. That's where I'm based. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of the scale of some of the pieces and the resin finish that I do, which is not evident in just online images. But that's what that glossy um, reflection is happening from the resin finish. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background of me, I've always been a creator of sorts. My, you know, favorite class in elementary school was art. I took it all the way through high school. Um, but a changing point really was my senior year in high school and I won an art scholarship and I had to declare an art major in college to keep it. And so that's what I did. <laughs> I wanted to keep the money. Um, and so that really just kind of made me commit to art in a way that I hadn't uh, mentally done before. And so that was kind of a game changer. Um, I actually graduated with a biology and art degree. Um, however, after graduation, I have not once put the <laughs> biology degree to use. Um, art won me over for sure. And so after graduation, um, I taught art at the middle and high school level for several years uh, here in Little Rock. Um, and then I guess probably about five years ago, I quit teaching and went full-time art. And so that, that's kind of where I'm at in my career right now. Um, the pandemic has surely thrown a kink in my <laughs> usual routines daily and annually um but I'm still making work and exhibiting work hopefully in the near future when the world is normal again um and then of course selling work to collectors all over um so I'll kind of work you through the last six or seven years of work and how like the early pieces led to uh you know the subsequent series up until what I'm working on right now um, and I think you'll see a connection through the early works, through the later works. Um, and then I'll talk about my mediums. I use a lot of different materials in my work. Um, I call myself a figurative painter and I call them paintings, but they're actually uh, more, there's more to them than just paint. Um, however, I treat all the materials I use as if they were paint. And so that's why I, I call them paintings. Um, but they are definitely mixed media pieces. Um, and then of course I, I operate very well on question and answer. So if I forget to talk about a process, I'm so intimately entwined with my process that sometimes I will forget to mention something. So please ask a question and I'm happy to answer it. Um, and then that way you, you know, get more out of this than, than you would otherwise. So I guess I'll share my screen now. Um, this is my first time sharing my screen. Um, so is that working for everyone? Yes, it is. Looks Oops. good. I wonder if I can move people's faces along this side. There we go. Okay, so um, this body of work probably started around 2013. Um, up until that point, I, you know, I had done academic work in college and, uh, and I was ready to just do my own thing. I mean, I had been out of school for a few years, several years, 
Um, and I was ready to just kind of launch into a new brand new body of work and explore new materials. And so that's what I was started with these works. And they were portrait studies. They were pretty small. They're like nine by 11 size. Um, and the mediums are ink, watercolor, and resin. And so it was my first time mixing ink and watercolor together. It was my first time using resin at all. And if you don't know what I'm talking to about when I reference resin, it's uh, it comes in two parts. It's an epoxy that you mix an epoxy with a hardener and it's a very hard uh, glass-like surface when it cures. And so it, it's kind of tricky to work with if you don't mix the proportions right or if your environment that you're mixing it in is, isn't clean or yeah, so it's a beast to work with in the beginning. So it took a few pieces to kind of get a, a process down. Um, but I really love how it makes the ink and watercolor permanently wet looking, which is why I fell in love with the material. Because um, if you've ever painted with ink or watercolor after it dries, it loses that uh, freshness because it's not wet anymore. So the resin kind of brings it back to that wet look. Um, so I started, obviously you need watercolor paper if you're painting with ink and watercolor. And so all the paintings are on watercolor paper. Um, but since the resin is so thick, it was a problem to, I mean, you obviously can't just pour it on paper because it would kind of buckle and be a big mess. And so that was another problem I had to solve was how to combine all three of those materials together. And so I started building wood panels to mount the paper onto and it gave it that rigid support for the resin. So they, they don't look like they're on watercolor paper in the, in the end, but, but they are. And um, it's just mounted on a wood panel. And so the concept behind these pieces, uh, I really just wanted to focus on facial expressions. I did not want to paint a specific person, which is kind of how I still operate in my later works, as you'll, you'll see later. Um, they can represent anyone in that sense and not a particular person. And I also wanted the facial expressions to be honest and unusual and uh, kind of different than how you see people imagining themselves being painted, like with pleasant faces or, or you know, content, or I mean, content, not contempt. <laughs> um, and so they're kind of ambiguous in how they feel and sometimes they're looking straight at you and sometimes they're off in their own gaze. They're not really uh, concerned with anyone that is looking at them. They don't even, they seem to not even be aware that they're the subject of someone's painting. Um, so the, that's kind of where that work started. And I did that for a few years. I did over a hundred of these portrait studies um, and they're all, they're almost all gone now. They all have homes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so then this, you can see how it easily led to these pieces, which came a little bit after those. So I, I wanted to mix a little bit of tightness and, and order into the chaotic painting of the face. And so I would still do the face, um, how I wanted loosely and expressive and ambiguous and full of emotion, but then the clothing that the big or the portraits the sitter would be wearing would be more detailed and ordered and in a totally different material. So uh, they're composed of mostly Asian collage papers and acrylic paint. So that's what the clothing is made out of. Um, and so I was just really playing with loose and tight and expressive and representational and just kind of the opposites smashed together in one piece. Um, and I had so much fun doing these. You can easily see how they led to the, the later works that are coming. Um, another important thing that I forgot to mention is that I don't draw faces, the faces in the beginning. I just paint. Um, and I paint with a really loose, wet on wet style. So I basically wet the whole watercolor paper with water and then I'll add ink and watercolor. So it really allows them to spread and pool together and create these really interesting, um, I guess, can y'all see my cursor? You can see yes, these interesting. 
Oh, awesome. Yeah. So you can see the interesting pools and puddles that happen because of all that water that I paint with. Um, and so that, yeah, I forgot to mention that with the faces. I also like to paint uh, really diverse uh, representations of people because I feel like that is lacking in a lot of art historically. Um, you know, when I was younger and I went to museums, I never saw anyone in a portrait that looked like me. So that that's always in the back of my mind as well. Um, just trying to represent the every person in different pieces. Um, so then you can see how these pieces led to, oh, forgot, I included some process pictures too. So the one on the left, you can uh, see the, you know, the the paper is really wet and the colors are all bleeding together. Um, you can kind of get a glimpse of my art materials right here. I use a mixture of uh, Chinese watercolors and Western watercolors. Um, and then ink as well, Chinese ink, which comes in this vermilion orangey color and the black, the classic black ink. And then on the right, that's, I'm actually collaging and weaving different papers together for a piece. Uh, so that part's really fun. It's like using multiple parts of my brain in one piece. Really loose and expressive and then really detailed and, and time consum consuming. Okay, so these are the next series of works and these started in 2016, I think. I started doing these. Um, so that's about three years later than the, you know, from when I started in the portrait studies. Uh, I just really wanted to challenge myself compositionally. Um, I got like the next body of work I do is always like I got bored of something in the previous one. <laughs> so the previous one, it, the compositions were just a sitter. Um, so I really wanted to challenge myself and work in some perspective in rooms. Uh, multiple things interacting with each other in a piece, um, more complicated color schemes. And so you can kind of see all of that blending together in these pieces. Um, and the concept be behind these pieces were just to rebel against the docile female figure that was depicted in domestic settings throughout most of art history. I mean, if you are an artist in art school, you see these in your art history books. Um, but they're always like very put together and standing next to something that most likely does not belong to them because it belongs to their husband or father. Um, so I wanted to do the opposite of that where the female figures that I include in the rooms are, um, they own the space and they're obviously um, a major part of the space and it's almost as if the viewer is entering into their space. It's not the other way around. Like the, the female figure is not there for your viewing pleasure, but you're almost the one being viewed. <laughs> the viewer, like switching the tables around a little bit. Um, these pieces were also the first time I incorporated cyanotypes. So if you're not familiar with what cyanotypes are, it's a photography process. Uh, I'm not a cyanotype expert by any means, um, but it's a chemical that turns blue when you expose it to sunlight. And so you can see in these pieces where the blue photographs are included on the walls, those are the cyanotypes. Um, so in these pieces, it's ink, watercolor, collage, acrylic, and cyanotypes. Wow. See, I never knew that those were cyanotypes whenever I first um, kind of investigated the series. Um, I had always thought that those were collage elements similar to like the patterning. So that's really interesting little feedback that. Um, yeah, and they're so tiny to see in a digital image. I mean, the original pieces are obviously much larger and it is hard to, to capture that in, in just an image. Um, so I have some uh, in process shots. So I, for these, I do start drawing. Obviously, they're much more complicated compositionally. So I do draw them out. However, the faces I still don't draw. Those are always, I like them better when they're just loosely kind of spontaneous and, and not drawn. So I'll still leave those blank in the drawing. Um, 
but you can see I was working everything out in the drawing and then here's the finished piece. And these are still cyanotypes in this one. Um, however, you can tone those blue, the natural blue tones. And so here I've toned them using coffee of all things. The acid in the coffee tones the blue or changes the blue tones to black and tan color scheme. So, so um, Lisa, we got a question in chat and I think it's it, it might be good to ask now. Sure. What's the difference between um, American uh, watercolor and Chinese watercolor? Uh, more of a Western watercolor and like a Chinese watercolor that you were talking about before. Oh yeah, um, so the Western ones you typically see in tubes and they're really wet and um, you thin them down with water. Most of the time, uh, Chinese or Asian watercolors are in pans and they're like cakes and you add water and then it becomes paint. Um, to me, they just have a completely different color choice between the two. And so if I use both of them, I get twice the amount of color choices. Um, and the Asian ones are like chalkier, if that makes sense. They're not as... Uh, yeah, if you can just imagine a chalky type of watercolor paint and a non-chalky one. And so I like to have more options, so I use both of them together. And they interact with each other differently, like sometimes they'll repel each other and create interesting textures. Um, so I like that too. That's why I mix both of those together. I hope that Very answers cool. the question. Yeah, no, thank you um, for that question, yeah. by the way. Uh, so here are some details that you can kind of see all those different materials at play in these interior pieces. Um, so the, just in this one, the fireplace is an acrylic, except for the interior part, which is ink and watercolor. All the patterned areas and the curtains and the wallpaper are the Asian papers, as well as the suit. Uh, the chair is watercolor. The gold frame is acrylic. And of course, the cyanotypes. So there's, I love different things about different materials. And so different things lend themselves to certain materials. Um, I did a couple interiors of just a black and white color scheme. So exclu the exclusion of the watercolor is in those pieces. It's just the ink and acrylic and cyanotypes and collage. So those are some details. So those pieces led to this series, which is my most recent series, uh, The Girls and Guys. Um, so it's almost like I zoomed in on just the female figure in those uh, interior pieces for this series. Uh, I wanted to play with cutting off the faces. And, it, and so all of the pieces in the series don't have a full face. Um, and for the interior ones like these, these two, this one is actually behind me. <laughs> you can see that. Um, it was just a different compositional problem to solve, like how to picture someone in a room when, when you couldn't see their face. And so the horizon line is really high for a normal interior composition. Um, and then it gave me a lot more freedom to play with the clothes themselves because they were uh, magnified in scale. So um, I got more intricate in my cyanotypes, uh, more intricate in the clothes collage work. Um, and since there wasn't a face in these, I got to use body language and clothing to get all that emotion and expression in the piece since I didn't have a face to use. So it's kind of a, a twist on the previous pieces, but still the same concepts of expressionism and uh, subversive female um, illustration or depiction. Um, the focus is really on the hands in these pieces. I love drawing hands, I always have. Um, and so there's, I try to infuse as much emotion and expression in a single hand as possible. Sometimes too, if I can fit it in the composition. So these, uh, I have some detail shots of these too, because you can't really see the cyanotype patterning in the clothing unless you look up close. So this one right here, is blown up right here. Um, so for these, I still use cyanotypes, but I first made a digital collage, uh, a collage of the image first, and then use that image to make uh, a cyanotype, if that makes sense. 
Um, so these are uh, stock images that I purchased. Um, I wish I could take a personal picture of a snarling wolf, but I'm fresh out of those. <laughs> Um, so I have some stock photography of these predatory animals that I've digitally made patterns out of, and then I'll make cyanotypes out of those patterns. And then it's fun finding ways to infuse them in clothing in different ways. Um, so here is the natural blue tones, and this one, uh, I've toned it with the coffee to make it the black and tan color scheme. Um, and then here, it's also in the blue tones. It's so interesting because uh, whenever you see those and they're digital and they're small, those don't look like they have little tiny snarling wolves in them. They just look like a pattern. Um, uh, and so- Yeah, it is very hard. It's very hard in a pandemic world to, to illustrate this to, or to like explain this um, without looking at you know, them in person. Um, yeah, because from far away, they just, like, they just look like patterns. But they do. Close. So I appreciate those details a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of gave a whole new perspective on them. I, I love the series even more now. So thank you for that. Cool. Um, and yeah, so working with patterns has its own set of challenges. It's like sometimes I want a sense of three dimensional form, but I'm working with a, a flat pattern that I can't, you know, mold and shape and like you can with oil paint to make it look like it's three-dimensional. So sometimes I will paint on top of those patterns, like in this particular one, you know, her hand is obviously in front of the clothing, so there should be a shadow underneath it. But since it's a pattern, you know, it came with its own challenge. So I had to do a very thin ink wash on top of the sanitypes. So it, it's kind of layer upon layer and each piece has a new problem to solve, which I love. Um, and this is, this is toned to the black and tan color scheme in this piece. Um, sometimes I'll create the whole pattern and use that, or sometimes in this piece right here, I'll cut out individual cyanotypes and, and manually create a pattern. So I'm in here, it, those are crocodiles um, that I'm gluing together to make a pattern. Well, I don't know, what happened? Okay. <laughs> Oh, am I drawing on this? I think I'm actually accidentally drawing on this. <laughs> Just excuse those green marks. I don't know where those came from. <laughs> um, so everything, since I use so many different materials, everything kind of happens in a certain order. So I'll, the painting part always comes first. It's so wet and loose that, you know, if I were to do that after collaging, it just wouldn't work. So uh, things have to happen in a certain order. And kind of see I'm um, piecing all the collage cyanotypes in to the jacket. Um, okay, so this is an you actually have caught me in a, a not regular occurrence. I'm in a major transition of style and concept right now. Um, I spend most of my days in my studio just staring and thinking. <laughs> because I'm like starting from scratch pretty much with this style, with this series. Um, I relatively recently became a mother. And so he's now 16 months old, but you can see him and his, he can reach the paint on my table now. <laughs> so that's him. But, you know, obviously becoming a mother is a life-changing event. And so I felt like it was the right time to make a drastic change in my art conceptually. And so I'm, um, I'm doing a series of works on motherhood um, and I'm incorporating concrete for the first time in my work. In this middle picture, you can see um, the, my, those are based on my hands. Uh, they're made of concrete. And so that has its challenges. Um, uh, because I'm doing concrete, I have to have multi-layered panels because the concrete is actually below the painting. And so, there's multiple layers of shaped panels. Um, I'm learning how to draw with a jigsaw, which is really fun. <laughs> um, so these are in the very beginning stages. I'm not quite sure, you know, little details on which direction I'm going. Um, but, you know, here's a sneak peek at what is coming next. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's what's happening in my studio. And I'm happy to answer any questions or 
Yeah, else? we actually got a we got a couple here already. So um, you know, before I before I jump into the chat, I do want to say that I did not know whenever you first sent me that 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 was concrete. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, that's a really interesting, I, you know, um, as an artist, I never really thought about working with concrete. That's never really like crossed my mind. So that really kind of, I'm interesting to, to see that, like the artist statement behind that, because that almost like kind of like signifies strength and yeah. kind of like a foundation in a way. So I, I love that. Um, let me go ahead and go into the chat. Uh, and this one's from Patricia Reeves, and she asks, um, please describe the board and how you apply the art to the board and how do you uh, like avoid wrinkles um, with such large pieces and um, like applying the resin and what glue you use? Yeah, so this these were trial and error. <laughs> All those, I don't know why I put myself in this position, but there's like no information out there with what I want to do. And so it, it takes a lot of trial and error and trashed pieces to, to figure it out. Um, but I use a heavyweight watercolor paper, so that helps with the buckling for sure. Um, I use gel medium, like heavy gel medium to uh, adhere it to the panel. So I just spread it on the wood, kind of like icing on a cake, and then, you know, smush it out from the center. Um, and it has worked really well. I rarely have issues with buckling um or, or you know rippling in the paper um as far as glue the gel medium also works really well as a glue I mean it's it's really a, a, a great thing to have in your studio you can even mix it into acrylic paint to make it thicker I mean it's a really versatile material if you're an artist um I, I use the golden brand uh but I think a, a few different paint companies make a version of it um does that answer that question? Or I think so. Also, right about now, you guys, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, put something in chat if you have a question. Um, and um, yeah, just ask away. Uh, we still got about uh, 20 minutes left um, on uh, the questions. So um, yeah, go ahead and ask. And I have a couple of my own, but I'll let you go first, you guys. So um, uh, just feel free to ask any questions and unmute yourself or answer it in chat. If you put it in chat, um, I'm checking it. And so I will uh, voice it. Um, so don't be shy. Um, oh, I have the chat pulled up too, so I can see it now. I guess I have a question. Um, I, I guess I what I was really struck by like the the body stances. Like a lot of them aren't like air quotes like ladylike. Um, and I was wondering, uh, maybe you mentioned that, maybe I missed it, but but I was just kind of in, interested in that decision. And like I, I mean, I, I really like your work, and I I found that really powerful. But it was something that really stood out to me about your work, and so I was curious about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say from the very beginning, my work has always been about depicting depicting a more honest whole vision or vision, you know, vision of a woman. And so I felt like previously, you know, most of what was out there was either hypersexualized images of women or super docile and demure women, um, or women that were very aware of being the subject of someone's gaze, almost to the fault of their own identity. And so I wanted to do the exact opposite of all of those things. So, um, and you know, different poses have strengths in different aspects, but some of them are confrontational and some of them are aggressive and some of them are completely oblivious to being someone's gaze. They're busy gazing at something themselves. Um, and so the gestures and, and poses are supposed to be really obvious in, in those senses. Um, and I'll use the hands as even a more obvious <laughs> like gesture, like with a fist or um, I have one painting where she's flipping you off with her middle finger, which uh, I wasn't sure how people would take that. But then a hotel in New Orleans like hung a print of them in every single one of their hotel rooms, which I think is awesome. 
Um, so the fact that there is a want and a need to see women in these ways is awesome. And I, because I wanted that and that's why I did it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. I really like your work. They feel like, like power stances and like, also that they're like in kind of like professional clothing, um, or like somewhere along those lines. It just, yeah, it just really stood out to me. And yeah. The club. Thing, yeah, the more layers and the more structure, you know, in the clothing, it gives me more opportunities to play with those patterns and infusing the animals. Um, so that's why they're really like um, detailed and almost elaborate clothing, um, which is what the title of that series, Girls and Guys, Guys re references the clothing. Um, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> But yeah, the, the more structure and the more layers and the more pieces of clothing, I get to infuse more patterns and, and things. So that's why I do that. Do you know how to sew? I'm sorry? Do you know how to sew? Uh, I do not. Well, I tried um, yeah. and failed miserably. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just curious since you're working with the fabrics and or pretend fabrics anyway. Um, but, you know, yeah. they look, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's certain, been, oh, sorry to interrupt you. I just was going to say, it takes a certain amount of, you've, you've looked at clothing a lot on people or something because they look like they're, they're not just flat, you know, the, the yeah. clothing isn't flat. It looks really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I make an effort to follow the seams and the directions. So like mm -hmm. if an arm is, is going up, that means the pattern would go this way and then this way. And so I do right. make, yeah. um, you know, well, that's you'll all. Really, you'll be really good at sewing if you try it. <laughs> maybe I should give it, yeah, maybe I should give it another shot. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was a sewing machine's fault. It wasn't mine, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't 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 feel uh, too bad, Lisa. I am also uh, the sewing machine's fault whenever I try to sew. So <laughs> don't feel don't feel too bad. Me and a, me and a sewing machine do not get along. So but yeah, it has never worked. It's been a while since I tried again. But <laughs> what if I could say something? Question? Yes. Yes, I, of course. I, I got to meet you at one of your. Um, you came up to Springdale uh, to one of our art festivals along Emma Street and yeah. got to meet you and buy a couple of your uh, watercolors there. And I just absolutely love these pieces and I'm recently got to see your um, little film or a bit, kind of a, a blurb on Crystal Bridges. It was about oh, you yeah. and your, yeah, it was great. But, but getting to see what you're working on now with the concrete in your work is just fabulous. It's so mm -hmm. amazing what you're doing with both um, the architectural, the fabric, the figurative, and even your um, animals bringing the, the personalities and the, and the feelings into those. I really appreciate getting to see your work. Thank you for doing this talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's not, well, in a pandemic world, I don't get to talk to too many people. <laughs> artists are like more isolated than anyone, I think, or, you know, True. artists of yeah. all kinds, even performance artists. Um, so yeah, I appreciate being able to, to talk to you guys. Um, I guess I can kind of show you more of the studio while other people are waiting on questions, but you know, there's all my papers in the box right there. And some finished pieces. That one behind me is a commission I'm working on for someone. Um, they requested a German Shepherd and so there's one in the rug right there. Um, and then those are some portrait studies. Oh, the only ones I have left. I'll make some more eventually. I had a question. Sure. Um, we, we kept getting kicked off so you may have answered it. Uh, was there a, is there a particular uh, brand and or weight of water that you use that you work with a brand of watercolor is that what you asked paper 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 watercolor yeah. paper 
Mm-hmm. Um, I get really big rolls because my pieces are like this piece right here. Can you see my cursor still? Probably not. But that long piece right there, um, that's one sheet of watercolor paper. So I, I have to get them in rolls and only so many companies make large rolls of watercolor okay. paper. Um, so the brand I get is Strathmore and it's just like the 140 pound. It's not like arches you know it's not if it was arches it'd be like a thousand dollars a roll or something right. um but it's very economical it's just kind of the student grade uh watercolor paper roll that I use um I wish rolls came bigger but it's, they're hard to find really big sheets okay thank you yeah of course Oh, and Blick Art Materials has them on their website. That's where I usually order them. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel you there. I, I, I uh, as someone, you know, working with pastels, there's only certain brands that have um, large rolls of paper. And um, mm-hmm. so it's interesting how you say that artist David Balin, he was talking about how he gets his um, paper, which is like nine by nine feet, um, yeah, from a company that's basically it's the end of the wax paper roll, and I'm, I'm like, it's interesting to see how, you know, um, large canvases are are easy to come by, but like large paper yeah. is very hard, very hard. Yeah. Now, I of course I would be the artist that hates painting on canvas, <laughs> like, like none of my work since college has ever been on canvas. Um, that would make life easier. Shipping, that would make shipping a lot easier too. Just roll it up and ship it. Um, shipping is the worst. I hate shipping art. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel ya. Um, do we got any more questions? Uh, feel free to put it in chat if you're a little shy. Um, um, I have a question. May I ask a question? Sure, of course. Can you hear me? I looked mm-hmm. at your. I think I looked at your website, and you had a series of just lips. I oh yeah. What's um, the story with with that? And when where was that in your career? Uh, they're they're not. I don't have like a dedicated portfolio page to those on my website. Just I don't know why I never got around to doing it. But yeah, I did several of those. Um, and they're kind of the same philosophy where I just infused all the emotional expression in just a mouth. And so they were very simple in composition. It was just the mouth against a white background. And a lot of the mouths were open and yelling and speaking and, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't just like sexy mouths <laughs> that you often see, you know, in popular culture or popular art, I guess. Um, and so some of them, I didn't even, a circle, I did some circle mouths where they were like five inches in diameter and they were actually sourced from images from protests. And so I would look at images <clears throat> of protesters and their, the shape of their mouth and, um, and then use those as the subject matter for those pieces. Um, so yeah, that's what those are about. <clears throat> I guess I had another question. Um, I, uh, I know you're talking about shipping and everything and I was wondering if you uh, had explored um, like NFTs uh, as like a, a a way of presenting your work or you okay, okay so <laughs> some of the artists I follow on Instagram can you explain what that is yeah because I don't know what it is <laughs> yeah sorry um I and I haven't done this yet either but it's basically like um you're selling a digital file of your work but it's like encrypted with a code in the same way that cryptocurrency is so it can be programmed so you the artist profits from the the resale of the work uh and then of course there are all these things that it's like it's also exciting because you don't have to worry about about shipping or or any of that uh so yeah I I guess uh some people are really excited about this and and I was just sort of curious if it was something you were interested in or doing but I'm still like getting wrapping my head around it because in my mind I'm thinking well couldn't they just 
if it's a digital file, could they just print multiple copies and then, I, I don't know. So, I mean, if that is not, not a possibility, like people profiting without my knowledge, I, I would be into it. Um, but yeah, I do. Yeah, that recently like showed up on a bunch of artists that I follow on Instagram. And I was like, what is this? I'm so confused. So I need to learn more about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's where I am too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not the most tech savvy person. I try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting better, but I'm I'm really not either. <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer any more questions or if you want to see more of the junk in my studio or whatever. <laughs> I'll be a little greedy um, and kind of take the question spotlight um, for at least a couple minutes. Um, and maybe you're not ready to share this yet, but I'm interested in that new series that I saw that you were working on. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about it just because, um, you know, I want to, I want to be, you know, I want to be knowledgeable, but also like the first person, like I get a sneak peek. Um, so if you want to, you can, but if you're not ready yet as an artist, I totally understand and I do not want to push you. I have no hesitations to talk about it. It helps, actually. <laughs> yes, yes, please um, do. So it just my experience with motherhood, this is my first child. Um, I, I, I'm not young, so I've kind of waited a long time to have a child. Um, but the experience, the I mean, there are lots of things I could talk about for hours about what it's like to be a new mother. But the biggest thing that I wanted to focus on artistically was the huge dichotomy of it like it's extremely joyous but extremely painful and it's extremely happy but you are also extremely vulnerable so it's all these extremes that are mashed together in such a confusing magical way <laughs> if it, I mean if there are any parents out there I hope I'm making sort of a, a connection to how you felt um, and so I wanted to do that in, in an art series with materials. Um, so I'm using a lot of different materials. It almost looks like uh, like the painting itself is having an identity crisis because a lot of new moms have an identity crisis <laughs> like I did. Um, and so there's there's concrete and then there's, you know, which is a very strong industrial material that you don't ever see in paintings. And then there's watercolor, this very traditional feminine material that's been used for centuries. And then there's acrylic. And then I'm also gonna incorporate some of the resin. And so there's opaque uh, areas and there's gonna be translucent areas and there's going to be matte areas and shiny areas, um, really bright, colorful areas and the gray colors of the concrete. And so it's, it's all this mishmash of, um, opposites because that's kind of what I was thinking like how could I feel all these opposites all at once being a mother and it makes sense and so making that in an artwork like how do I use all these materials and have it still make sense is kind of where I'm headed <laughs> and I'm still solving trying to solve some of those problems <laughs> um so hopefully that kind of gives you a glimpse of the direction I think I'm heading Yeah, it really does. Um, I, I really appreciate that insight. I mean, I mean, it sounds great and I can't wait to see how they kind of come together. Um, and so uh, I'll be definitely, you know, waiting on that and looking at, you know, refreshing the page on your website, you know. Um, I'm not necessarily, but, you know, I'll, uh, I'll be looking for it whenever it comes out and, you know, we have some finished products. Um, yeah. I do, there is another question um, from Hannah and she says, um, how did you make the transition to being a full-time artist? Um, that was definitely a problem I had to solve on my own. <laughs> there is, there are no artists in my family. So I had no one to, you know, look towards for advice or tips. Um, so, like I said, I taught art for several years, um, but I never stopped making art. And so every nights, weekends, summer breaks, spring breaks, I was always developing my own work. 
um, and showing work at the same time. So if, if you are doing another job, but art is when it is your ultimate goal, um, you, I, my advice is just to make time to make that art because that is, you know, what you're aiming for. So don't stop, um, it, even though it's hard, of course, if you're working another job. Um, but while I was doing that, I started, you know, gaining a lot of attention and um, having more exhibitions and participating in art fairs. And so it just got eventually, you know, a couple of years of doing both of those things, uh, basically full two full-time careers. Um, one of them had to go. I just couldn't uh, do both of them forever. So I had to let teaching go and, you know, m made the leap. And, and just having, just I would say, just having 100% of your time able to be focused on art is amazing if you've never been able to do that because your art just gets better exponentially because you have way more time to focus on it. Um, so I would say it's gradual and hard. <laughs> um, there's another question. How does the concrete stay in place? Um, so the the main painting is a wood panel and then I built a box under that wood panel to hold the the concrete so it's like a sheet not I mean a sheet makes it sound really thin but you know an inch to two inches of concrete below the painting in a box if that makes sense um and they're connected so it won't like move around so that's how that's how I've or how I'm trying to solve that problem of how to incorporate concrete in a painting that sounds oh, really heavy mm -hmm. oh. sorry I I interrupted somebody. Did I go ahead and repeat that? Oh, I said I said I love the big hands. Yeah, hands. they look great. Thanks. I, that, ever since high school, it's been one of my favorite things to draw. Oh, I was. Uh, I'm just sort of taking this drawing class at the art center now, so I'm not very good at it as a beginner. Um, but I was looking at Jacob Lawrence's pieces and his hands and your hands kind of are the same, have that same strength in them and they're all a, a little overly, they're overly big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely want um, hands to be mm -hmm. in emphasis yeah. in all the pieces. Yeah, that's an intentional choice. Um, but stick it, stick with it. It's it's hard. <laughs> the drawing the figure is hard. Right. Um, it takes so much practice. Um, but stick with well, it. It's different than what I, anything else I've ever done. I mean, it's totally, it is, and it yeah. surprises me all the time about. Yeah. You know, it surprises me. It's it's weird. It's so obvious when you when it's not right, but it's not so obvious on how to make it right. <laughs> it's not like that with other things you draw. All right, you guys. Um, it's about time to kind of wind down um, this lecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about our upcoming programs. Uh, but first off, I want to thank you, Lisa, for having amazing lecture. I love seeing all the details of your process and what you were making. Um, and so um, especially what you're working on now, I love having that little sneak peek. Um, so a little bit about what we have coming up next uh, over at uh, the Regional Art Museum. We have a new lecture series uh, with our lecture live um, called Sensual Art. It basically talks about how uh, the human figure uh, has been displayed across, uh, uh, you know, art history. And so if you're really interested in that, um, it, it's a little bit more, um, a little, it's a little bit more in, involved on like the kind of sensuality of the human figure, um, not necessarily sexuality, but how uh, the human figure was portrayed in, in the nude. Um, and so, uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on and it'll probably be about eight lectures uh the series will but it starts um next uh week with a with a look at antiquity and um uh roman 
uh, statues as well as um, uh, African statuettes. So uh, if you're interested in kind of an antiquity view of the human form, be sure to catch that. Uh, our assistant curator will be uh, leading that lecture. So um, that's all I got for you right now. Of course, we also have our RAM sketch uh, free for everyone on Tuesday nights. Um, so I know some of you actually go to that. So, um, uh, you know, we just have basic drawing skills uh, that, are, that are taught um, and a really nice artist community that kind of comes and we talk about art and it's a very laid back approach uh, to drawing. Um, we're gonna be starting figures next week on Tuesday, 7 p.m. So uh, that's just something we have coming up. Well, uh, that's all I have for you as far as like upcoming events over at uh, RAM. I wanna thank you all for coming and Lisa, especially thank you to, uh, you know, kind of coming on and uh, talking about your artwork. It was really nice to kind of get a behind the scenes look at some of your processes. Yeah, thank um, you so much for having me. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and hop off here. Uh, I will see you uh, guys next time. All right. Good deal. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.